Welcome to another episode of Retro 79 and today I'm just going to do a quick review video of Neil Gaiman, Gaiman's Neverwhere and um, this is uh, I suppose I don't know what do you call it repurposing or an adaption to graphic novel by writer Mike Carey of the story uh, by Neil Gaiman, Gaiman uh, with art by Glenn Fabry and um, this is of course released by Vertigo which uh, doesn't exist anymore uh, Vertigo was you know um, a part of, of DC uh, it was an offshoot a kind of a separate uh, line which focused on more kind of um, adult teams and uh, adult fiction and a lot of the creators who, who worked on the vertigo line uh, were creators who came over from 2000 AD and who would be considered you know very uh, much out of the the norm uh, of mainstream art you know they're different different in style and tone and content and uh, there was no real kind of superhero affair uh, there was a lot of horror and fantasy and uh, stuff like that and uh, Neil Gaiman, Gaiman uh, he wrote a lot of stuff for, for the Vertigo line and a lot of fantasy uh, material you know uh, this book you know, I started off and, and I wasn't really into it. Um, and I haven't read a lot of Neil Gaiman's work. So, you know, I, I, I won't say that I'm, I'm a massive fan. But um, this one was a real... It's, it's an adaption, of course, by Mike Carey to the graphic novel form. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a real slow burner. I wasn't enjoying it. And it really took a while for me to get into it. And I had to put it down and come back to it a few times. Uh, I didn't read this in one sitting. But um, I think it was like halfway through. Then I really started to get into it. And yeah, it had a satisfying conclusion. And turned out to be a really absorbing story. And something that I, I couldn't put down. Uh, which is strange, you know, like when I when I started reading it, I was like, eh, don't really like the look of the main character, uh, the main character, Matthew, he's a bit of a sap, and um, he's just, he's a loser, but then we have this character uh, called Dor, and um, she has the ability to open doors into another world everywhere another world which exists coexists with the world we live in but um, is not visible to regular people um, in our world so what happens is She's attacked and she is saved by Matthew, and then he gets dragged. Here's Matthew. He gets dragged into this um, alternate reality. And this is quite a common theme in Neil Gaiman's work, and um, you even see it in in um, I saw it in the cartoon movie, the stop motion animation movie, uh, Carolyn, where also you have an alternate reality that coexists with the reality that we live in and uh, I, yeah I think he uses this quite a lot you know and, and this is something that goes back to you know ancient times like even in, in Irish mythology you have the the underworld which is the world of the fairies and pixies and you know leprechauns and magical beings and uh, they coexist with the regular world, but the rules are completely different. 
uh, it's a world of magic and and um, it's totally different to obviously because it's magic to the world that we exist in and they have special powers and, and they can do magical things um, so the same thing here you know you have characters who um, have special powers uh, special abilities and uh, Machu really is a complete contrast to this world as he's just a regular uh, guy uh, I think in his maybe 30s a uh, bit of a loser you know he's uh, engaged to this really bossy overpowering woman and um, yeah as I said he's a real sap he's he's totally not a hero at all now in the story they use um, some characters from uh, literature uh, we have the the Marquis de Caraba which is the the alter ego alter ego uh, of the Count of Monte Cristo I think the Marquis of Caraba I think that's where it's from uh, if I remember rightly I could be wrong you can um, feel free to correct me in the comments but uh, yeah he's got quite an interesting look he's all blacked out you can just see his white eyes and pink lips so an interesting kind of looking character now the art of course uh, is drawn by Glenn Fabry and um, it's not often that you do that you see him doing uh, sequential work no I'm, I'm quite a big fan of Glenn Fabry I think he's just amazing amazing artist uh, especially in you know painting and uh, the cover to this series, you know, that you have in this collection, this is the graphic novel collected form. But then you have, you know, it follows suit, uh, follows like the the issues, the published issues. And you have the covers then without, um, you know, the title uh, just shows there as chapters. And... Um, yeah, the painted the covers are just fantastic. Now he worked in this with a guy called Tony Lee, Tony Luke, and Tony Luke was also another uh, prominent artist on two thousand AD. And uh, I'm sure Tony Luke, yeah, the one that I I'm sure I'm talking about, he's the guy who moved over to Japan and he became quite successful as an artist. Um, in Japan, one of the few examples of comic book artists uh, who have made it big and who have, you know, transferred over to the Japanese market and uh, become quite a hit. And Tony Luke was, uh, yeah, he was a really cool looking dude, uh, a bit like a like a like a goth type guy, and um, his art was really amazing. So. I don't know how much of this is by uh, is Glenn and how much is by Tony Luke. Uh, I think maybe Tony Luke was involved in the, um, you know, putting in stuff like this and um, giving it a more polished and uh, digitally rendered, I don't know, look. But uh, yeah, you can see here like just the fantastic, if you can excuse the glare, the fantastic ability of Glenn Fabry. Uh, he's just an incredible artist, really incredible uh, painter. Now, it's hard. It's hard when you, you have someone who's this methodical and this detailed. It's hard to transfer that to sequential work. And, and I do feel that he's, he's not really suited to sequential work mainly because you know you're you're working on a monthly title um i don't know if this is monthly or not but you know there's there's time constraints and you have to get that work out there so you have to take uh, a lot of shortcuts but still you know this is fantastic it's really great uh, really great but i don't know for me though i i think it was it's not as as fantastic as his painted work um but seriously though this is just amazing look at this monster just fantastic uh it is 
really nicely drawn and you can tell you know straight away Glenn Faber he's got he's he's got his own unique look a really great artist but I definitely think that his strengths lie uh, more so in the painted work and um, oh bit of nudity and um, look at this this is great this kind of guy is like a Mad Hatter type he really reminds me of the Tom Petty out of that that video that uh, Tom Petty the Heartbreakers had uh, don't come around no here no more where he plays the the Mad Hatter out of uh, Alice in Wonderland so that's that's really cool so I think maybe this kind of character is they use the reference of that this guy is a bit of um, what do you call Tommy boy uh, there's a name for it you know they would have been kind of prominent in the the oof the 60s is it the 60s and uh, they often you know wore a style that was like rockabilly kind of 1950s style you know with the mutton chops on the side and the crift hairdos real 50s style uh, clothing and uh, they often would get into fights with the mods the mods the the guy the mops the guys who who, who rode the um, who the the oh my god my brain is dead uh the mopeds i think yeah the mopeds uh which was a big craze uh, back in england in the the 60s i'm sure it was um so yeah really cool looking character um but for me yeah i think um glenn fabry definitely his work uh, is more suited to you know his, his painted work is much better and uh even though this is really fantastic um i still much prefer the pen and ink work he did on slaughter or slain or whatever you want to call it um which was oh man, my god it's really stunning towards the end uh, just before he he moved on to american comics but this guy just it doesn't get enough credit len fabry is just one of the most underrated artists out there and i don't understand why he's not held uh in such uh, esteem as say the likes of you know macfarlane jim lee you know they always get plaudits but for me jim lee's uh, art is is it's uh, stick and paste he's he's become so predictable and boring and he's never really deviated from his style but Lynn Fairbury just does these amazing elaborate painted covers and God he's, he's just uh, so much going on like look at these brilliant um, these brilliant uh, dining scene you, know, you have this king kind of a I don't know is he like a King Lear type kind of crazy monarch or King George but uh, just amazing um, he's just a great artist you know and he deserves more plaudits and again this is not even his strongest stuff you know but even at that like you know even Glenn Fabry at, at like even Glenn Fabry at 70% would still be amazing and even Glenn Fabry at 50% would still be amazing he's just that good he's so comfortable at drawing the figure and um, <clears throat> Drawing faces and oh, and he he just you know he can do these really um, <laughs> fantastic poses. You know his characters never look stiff, never look boring. They always have really nice gesture and um, really nice movement. You know, he's just. Um, just an uber talent just a really incredible artist and he's continued you know uh, god i don't know how old he is now but he has been in you know in comics for a long long time 
and he's still so consistent. Like he's his artwork now is still look at this. This is just wow, incredible covers. He deserves um that's just brilliant. Look at that. Love it. And and these are all, you know, I think some of this is maybe digital. Um, but that would be on Tony Luke's side. Because Len Fabry just I don't even know if he uses digital. He mainly is just that's class, I love this. Androgynous angel. And uh they're just great. You can see his powers lie more in the painted work. Just a great artist. I could I could go on for ages about his work. Look at that. Great, look at this. Great movement. He's leaping off the ground to feed off. It's just right. Look at this. I love the way he draws hands. Sorry, <laughs> talking of hands. Yeah. This is uh, what happens when you're playing with blades, sharpening your pencils. Um, speaking of blades, though, look at this great throw, throwing ability here, and um, really uh, great artist. And um, yeah, this is an okay book. I might read it again. Uh, as I said, it like it took a while to get into it. But uh, when you do, it's hard to put down. You know, it's a, a real slow burner. And uh, I quite enjoyed it in the end. Definitely worth a read. Would I buy it? No, I wouldn't buy it. But definitely worth a rental. If you can find a library somewhere. Uh, or if a friend has a copy. Definitely worth a read, you know. But I don't think you... It's it's not it's not a classic. You're not going to go back to this again and again. Um, it's okay. If Maybe if you're... A fan of Mike Carey or uh, Neil Gaiman. Maybe I'll keep on going back to this. But for me, it, you know, this, it was good. It was good. It was enjoyable. And uh, definitely worth a read. Uh, and I might go back and read it again. Because uh, I thought uh, it just really gathered pace. And all the parts, pieces came together. So, yeah, worth a read. I recommend. So, thank you for joining me. Uh, for another review and uh, look forward to chatting with you again soon and join me uh, here at Retro 79 where I will be reviewing more like quick reviews <laughs> even though this is 17 minutes but we'll try and put out some more quick reviews and uh, I'll try to start doing way more content and uh, movie reviews over the coming months. Uh, thank you for joining me and see you soon.